thank you all for coming I mean, the afternoon session of hope today. So the first talk will be given by Wahad, and he's going to talk us about I mean, our free foundation for Monai. Thank you. So looking at the context of a few language, and we want to use effects, right? So right now the contract says we're going to use Monads, right? That's, that's we're going to add effects to our languages. But monads don't compose, so we're going to use word transformers, right? So, or monads that to just change the word transformers. But as we've seen before, right, the order matters, right? Because now everything composes, so you can do it this way or that way, and they're different. Um, and if you actually look at what programmers do out, out there, then you do a lot of Basically, you, you do try and error, basically, right? So you, from your experience, you've tried this, this doesn't work, and so you have to use the other one. Um, and then when you look at more complicated things, you kind of think back about things you've seen before, etc., etc. And, and that, that actually, the reason very, very useful here, because they said, um, programmer inside an experience, and black art is, is, is kind of like <laughs> the, the tools of the trade. So, so anyway, so, so what I'm going to try to push to in this talk is a more systematic approach, and maybe even tools support. I don't claim to have a general answer, but, but we're going to look at some directions. Okay, so so just just to, sh to give you a taste, um, let's look at the demo of maybe some kind of tool support. But I'm not going to go through the details. Late, we'll come back to it later. Okay, so we're going to be writing some kind of description of how we want our effects to interact, and then it's going to give us back um, how to how to compose our Transformers. So, so, so this one says, yes, you should you should apply the, the error transformer to the state monad. Right? And if you put on a different description, again we'll come back to it later. Everything will be clear towards the end of the talk. And then we'll say, no, no, no. In this case, we should apply the state transformer first to the exception monad. Okay, so, so we'll come back to it later. Um, but that's kind of like, maybe to try to push towards that. Okay, but there is some kind of small print that I should say up front. Um, you can't, we can't handle all monad transformers, and if you just ignore the conjugation one, then we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that five bit later. And it might give you false negatives. It will say, I can't find a stack, even though maybe there is a stack that it can find. Okay, so, so just the talk structure. So at first I'm going to talk yet again about algebraic effects. I'm going to give a bit more background. So I'm going to be going through everything because some people might have skipped between sessions. But I'll try to go quicker to the part that we've seen before in the morning. Um, then I'm going to make a graph theoretic connection to a concept called cographs, which underline uh, the tool. Um, and now I'm going to describe the tool in more detail once we kind of know how things work. Okay, so let's look at the algebraic theory effects. Okay, so, so, so again, I'm looking towards Haskell, but really what I'm working on is at a semantic level. So I'm thinking about just to make things simple, sets and functions and monads over them. Okay, so, so in a very kind of classical situation here. Um, and so if we take a monad of a set, M, and a set E of exceptions, then an E exception monad is any monad that supports this Clivesby arrow, the generic effect. Raise from the set E to the uh, computations involving no, <coughs> no return values. Okay. Um, and if when we say that the initial E exception monad is, uh, is, is the monad uh, that has this operation, and for any other E exception monad has a unique monad morphism that preserves this. Okay, so if I take uh, for every other, other monad M prime that has a raise operation, a raise prime, if I apply H to the raise operation of, the, of this monad, of the exception monad, I get the other raise operation. So, so the exception one is special in the sense that it's the initial one. It's, 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 the, it's the, what's called the most free exception, uh, uh, monad that supports exception. And if you think about, again, um, Operations and equations, then, then, then you just add an operation for, for, for raising exceptions, and we'll get to that in a minute. Right. 
Now, if you look at global state, again, we've seen this quite a few times before, so very quickly. A monad for S global state, where S is a set of <coughs> states. It's two operations, get and put. And we have the three equations, and I'm going to put them in a more Haskell-like notation. I think this is more what, I, what Quark was doing earlier. Okay, so, so maybe that, that's going to be more readable to some people. By now, you've, you've kind of seen both flavors. This is what's called the generic effect style. Okay, and again, the global state monad is the initial state monad with respect. So, so for any other state monad, any other monad that supports these operations that satisfy these equations, there is the unique homomorphism that preserves this, these operations. Okay. So now if you try to generalize, or generalize, we've, again, we've seen this before, so what's a representation? It's a triple of three things. Okay, so first we have a set of operations. Okay, and for each operation we're going to have two sets, the parameters and the arities. And then using those operations, we can treat, treat them as the arrows. And using those arrows, then we can construct terms. And using those terms, we can talk, talk about equations. Okay, so what's the presentation? It's just a collection of uh, operations. And then we, using those operations, we can form uh, equations. So, so we've already seen So we've already seen one. Okay? So this is this is our, our this is our pi, and this is our arity for get, and this is our arity for put, and these are the three equations that we have. Okay, and for sections, right, we only have one operation, and it has e and the empty set, and no equations. Just to see how things will span out. And now the second part is once we have a presentation. We can talk about what, what position P is. We can talk about what the P, what the P monad is. Okay, and that's a monad that has Kleisley arrows or generic effects for each of the operations with arities that match. Okay, and then once we have this, this data, we can look at all the terms that we, that we had in our equations and interpret them inside our monad and see whether actually they denote the same thing. Okay, so so, so if, if all the equations in E are satisfied, we say that this is a P monad. And now there's a theorem, there's an old theorem, that the initial P monad always exists. And this goes back when we were earlier, um, I think it was Stelan and Quark, we're talking about um, Lovier's thesis and Linton. We know since the 60s that this always happens, it always forms this P monad. And the whole, if, if you heard about the algebraic theory effects, the, the whole process of now look, using these results, using, using this concept to look at computational meaningful monads, and understanding them in terms of these presentations, and so see what comes at the other end. So this is um, a short summary of this, I guess, morning session, or bits of the morning sessions. Okay. And um, one more thing I should say here is that the continuation one really doesn't fit that well in this setting. Okay, so it doesn't arise from a presentation. If I'm, I'm in, in this, so in this talk, I'm just going to completely put it aside and not, not deal with it. I don't know how to deal with it properly. You, you can maybe try to do something clever with containers and, or maybe some large large uh, yeah talk about size restrictions and, and growth in the universes all this other abstract nonsense but I'm not going to talk about it right? foundation issues okay so so let's look at a few more uh, examples so we, earlier as we said as I said we talked about exceptions and global states, so, so and we've already seen them before, so let's look at a few more examples. Um, so, the environment monad, right, um, can, you, you arise as this presentation, you have a simple, single operation get, and you, um, if you ignore the results that you get, it's as if you've done nothing, and if you do two gets, it's the same as if you've only done one and return the same result. Okay, that's how you get the environment monad. The right to monad for monads, you have any monoid, you can look at there's an associate monad for it, and this, this is a presentation for it. So you have for each element of your monad, you can act doing that action, and the action composed according to the monoid laws. And if you use the unit element of the monoid, it's just going to so you done okay. If is Valter still here? I don't know. So if, if people are familiar with free monads, that is Valter reintroduced into the functional programming community with his seminal 12. Then these arise as functors for a particular kind of presentation with no equation. 
I won't say much more than this. If you're interested, we can talk about it offline. But I will refer back to this example, just the details a bit more quickly. Mm. And one more. Me, what, what, why do you apply act to, to unit as a unit? So a monoid has a unit element? No, no, I'm, I mean the, the um, round bracket, the parenthesis. Aren't you supposed to apply act to, to the uh, monoid? No, you are correct. This is a typo. You are completely correct. This should be here. And yeah, you're completely correct. Sorry about that. It was spotted. Thanks. Thank you. And the last example. <laughs> so this is this is just mon the, the theory for monoids, right? Uh, only when you present it using generic effects, it looks a bit more icky. Um, but, but, but you have a... When you look at generic effects, you have okay, other fail. We can have some non-deterministic search happening, and you, and you keep track of the order. And this is how it looks like. Um, so give you ten more seconds to blur it, but it's really just the access for monoid rhythm in this stack. Um, okay. Right. So again, this is this is stuff we've kind of seen before, and a few examples we have not talked about today. So now we have. This gives you the list more. Right, so if you talk about combined effects, and again, Port mentioned, uh, touched on it in his talk, so a few more details. So if you look at the paper by Hallen, Falken, so the paper by Hallen, Falken, and Power, 2006, uh, that talks about different ways to combine presentations. Right? And so the key point is that monads don't really compose very well, but presentations compose really, really well. Um, so if I have two presentations, pi 1, pi 2, rd 1, rd 2, and the equations, and then I can just form the disjoint union of the, of the operations. And then once I do that, I can relabel the arities appropriately and relabel the equations appropriately and just pack everything together. Okay, so it's a, you have to be easy a bit with the details, but it's the obvious thing. Um, and then you get what's called a sum of the two presentations. Okay, and now theorem. Take the presentation for exception, so I have one, one operation uh, raised in no equations, and take an arbitrary other presentation P, then the monad for the sum of P and the exception presentation is the same thing as applying the error monad transformer for the monad arising from P. Okay. So in this sense, the action of this monad transformer arises by summing with the theory for exceptions. Do you have any axioms that uh, show the relationship between different effects? No, that's fine. There's, there, there isn't any. You, you take you take the the axioms from the from this theory, which is the any, right? And you take the axioms from this theory, whatever they are, and you just stick them together. So right. You don't add any any any, any interruption. <coughs> but how how do you know it's error t over m p and not the other way around? So. P x plus P and P plus e, P x is the same thing. You will always get this. And in fact, if you apply, if, if both of them are P x, so P, so it was, just what you done. So if I have, two kinds of exceptions. And you do this calculation, then what you get is error t of error x y. You can show that semantically it's equivalent. Right, but what, what, what if the other theory is the state point? Right. Then what you would get is uh, first applying the error transformer to the state point. But how do you know it's not the other way around? In fact, you see, since, so if you do it the other way around, you get an extra equation, which will get, just bear with me for three minutes, and then if you still have a question, we're going to talk about it. Okay? Well, it's a good question, it's a valid question. And the, the same thing holds if you look at the free monad, it's, it's, it's the same kind of... Uh, the same kind of result. Right? If I take the theory for the free one, which is just has the operations and no equations, and then I, I sum it with an arbitrary presentation, it's the same thing as applying, applying the free <coughs> the free monad transformer to that model. The first one is an instance. Yeah, exactly. 
It's a generalization. Thanks. OK, the other thing we can do with um, presentations right, is this. So we take the sum of the two presentations, and now for every operation op1 in p1 and op2 in p2, we add this equation that says that you can reorder the effects. Okay, so first I can do op1 with the result in x1, then I can do op2 with the result in x2, and I can do it the other way around. Okay. Uh, so I can, this is the valid equation, I can add it, and I can always add it. Okay, so, so the tensor, P1 tensor, P2, is this guy plus all these equations. Okay, and then theorem. So let's start with state. If I take the state, the representation for state, and any other presentation, P, and I look at the monad I get from the tensor, that's the same thing as applying the state monad transformer to that monad. Okay, so... If, if we go back to your question, right? So, so earlier, if we had uh, exceptions here so, and, and state, then we'd have if I if I do an except if I if I do some lookup and then I do some exception, it's the same thing as doing just the exception. Okay, and then you look up. And, and and indeed, what you would get is that that we they are the order. This is exactly what differentiates the two monad transformers, stack, the, one, the, the two monad stacks. Okay, Did that answer your question now. And now the same spiel holds if, if I look at the environment monad or the, the writer monad, just with the, uh, with the environment monad transformer, the linear monad transformer, or with the writer monad transformer. Okay, so that's kind of neat. Um, but it, this is all, um, yeah. So, so if, if you look at what we've covered so far, that's, that covers the MTL without continuations. Okay, so that's, that's nice. The question is, does it cover everything? And the answer is no, not really. So Quark mentioned um, uh, non different forms of non-determinism interacting. And here's another computational example. If you look at the uh, Eskelios list monad transformer, which is defined like this. Okay, so if I give a monad, uh, computations retur uh, returning A, then it's applying the monad to either the terminal object, the unit, the the unit set, uh, or returning some A element, and then continue recursively Returning other computation. Okay, so that's that. Can you just explain the acronym MTL? Uh, Monad transformer library. Okay. Sorry, that's in Haskell. Thank you. Sorry about that. Good question. Okay. Um, it's a standard Monad transformer library. So then, theorem: This Monad transformer does not arise as either the sum of tensor or tensor. Okay, it's. If I'm not wrong, it's the, the distributive combination. So, so I need to look into that a bit more. <coughs> But it's basically taking the sum and adding this equation, which says that um, if I look at my non deterministic choice, it distributes over the first part. So I have, I have two, two computations. I look at the choose operator. Then that's going to be the same thing as doing T1 and then sort of plugging in into all, all, all the return value, the T2, afterwards. <coughs> kind of. It's, it's this kind of good choose. All right. So my understanding is that this T then is only a monad when M is commutative. No, that's not the list monad transformer that's in the MTL. This is just Kelly-off's uh, list monad transformer, which is actually a proper monad transformer for any monad. Really up to the point where yeah, this exists. Because this might not always exist, if you, depending on the category you work in, because of fixed points and stuff like that. But if it does, then you pick your happen. It's a moment. Okay. Right. So now, so we have some degree of generality. So, so that now let's look at uh, kind of the setting of, of, of how we're now going to approach the, the first problem of, of how to order these. Uh, so we only look at one of the rise of sum of tensor. So that's, let's say, only the LTL, sum's continuation. Uh, and now we look at all the effects we want to have in our program. Okay, and for every pair, we're going to choose whether we should commute or not. So this is this commutative equation. Um, and then we ask, well, can I now find the sum of tensor term <coughs> that gives me this behavior? And does this sum of tensor term give me a monad stack? Okay, so if you now have to formalize this, and this, is, this was not just, this was not by this is originally in the Harald-Totkin power paper. It's in that, it's like in the last section, 
it's a hard paper to read. So not many people sort of get to that bit of the paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's like in the conclusion. Okay, so 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 okay. So if you look at, at, at this design choice, right? So so we have to choose wiper effect. That's basically saying create a, a vertex for every ca every effect and put an edge between them if you wanted to commute or not. So don't commute, commute. Just, you, generally, you need to give a graph. An undirected graph. And, an, an, undirected. an undirected irreflexive graph, correct. Um, and then you ask, well, now if you look at let's look at polynomials of this form, this kind of form of polynomials, I either have a vertex. Or I sum them up, or I tensor them up, can I now find a term that describes this behavior? Okay. And I'll formalize it even a bit better in the next slide. And moreover, does this term arise as, as a small stack? So if we look at the previous results, right, then a modern transformer right, is just a linear kind of combination. You sum with a single theory. So, so if this if this term is sum with a single vertex, then sum with another single vertex, then tensor with another single vertex. The monotransformers are the four. Yeah, yeah, the one. Yeah, yeah. List as well. No, no, list not, no, not list. Apart from list, because as I said, it's a non-example. It, it's not sum of that. Okay. Okay. So, so as I said, if we look at our terms before, right, then we, they they denote graphs. So, a single vertex is just a single vertex. The sum is take the, the two denotations, put them together side by side, that's the sum of the two graphs. And this is, um, if you, you take the two denotations and, and you connect all possible vertices from the different graphs. Okay. So, so that, that means that for every, every such term, every, this sum or tensor term, I can give a graph. Okay, and my question is, does there exist a graph? Does there exist a term that gives rise to the graph that I'm looking at as my input? Okay, so, so the first question you ask is, maybe all such Maybe all graphs have, have such terms, and the answer is no. If you look at this graph, or P4, it doesn't have any term that associates with it. Mm. <coughs> okay. This is, again, already, also in the, already in the original thing. So now, now let's look at sort of what I, a small thing I've added. Okay, so, so this is a well-known graph definition. A graph is, isomorph is, is called a co-graph if it's isomorphic to um, the denotation of any such term. Okay, and then the theorem, 181, the graph is a co-graph of if this graph does not embed into it. That means that you can't find four vertices such that have this property, and these, these, guys don't, are not, these guys are not connected. Okay, so you want to have these edges, or you want to not have these edges and not have the other ones. Okay, and it looks like magic, but if you want offline, I can give you the proof. Um, it's kind of cute, but it's not fun. Okay. Um, but the good thing about it is that if your algorithm now, yeah, so, so it's, it's a polynomial time algorithm, it's really straightforward, just look at it by good frost. But if it says no, then you get a witness. Right? So it's kind of easy to check once the algorithm says no. So that's kind of nice. But it doesn't give you the original term, so, so it's, not, it's not what I'm looking for. Right? So if I give you a graph, I really actually want the sum and tensor term because I want to look at the way it arises. But again, so another. Theorem for 99, so there is a linear time algorithm for deciding whether the graph is a co-graph and give me this sum and tensor decomposition. So that's, I'm happy now. Um, and if you want to know a bit about the details, it's the module decomposition, I can give you a bit more offline. And, as, and if you don't care about, about linear time, just polynomial time, you can actually do it in a few lines of ML, actually. It's not, if you have the right library. So I was using Wacom of that, you see. Okay. Okay, so now let's go back to the demo. I think I have, ooh, so, yes. so if we look at, at, what, we, at what we had, so first I define um, the effects. Okay, so I have rays instead. I said which smaller transformers they correspond to, and how would they, how do you get this smaller transformer either by sum or tensor? Okay, and then I say whether I want these two effects to commute or not. Okay, and then once you press analyze, right, the tool generates the graph and tells you checks whether it's an, a co graph or not, and if it does, it tells you. What is the sum and tensor term for it, and um, and uh, the stacking error? So it's it's. Yeah. Let's look at a particular a bit more elaborate example. So I have a few more effects. Okay, so I have uh, two kinds of exceptions: an I/O, which is a free, free monad, and some uh, environment monad, and some state monad. And I describe how they interact. Okay, and then we analyze it. 
and it gives it the term, and then it says, well, this is the monad stack you get out of it. Okay, and everything in braces can be permuted. They're all equivalent monad stacks. That's what we do. Okay, and, and this is the graph that you get. Okay, and just to play around a, a bit more with this, if we erase this line, this is just completely playing around with it all, right? Then you get a sum and tensor term, but there's no monad stack that, are, that, that conforms to this term because we don't have this kind of linear combination of things. We have, we have here, we have tensor, <coughs> tensor of sum. So we have sums on both sides of the tensor rather than just having a particular unique uh, theory on, on one of the sides of the tensor. Okay, uh, just if I add this, I should get neither. If I wire things up properly. Yeah, so this so this graph doesn't arise as, as the it's not a core graph and it gives you back the before embedding uh, of, of white. So, so, fine. So let, let's just look at the small print that I mentioned at the beginning. So again, uh, it only applies to algebraic effects, so no continuations, and also only to some to transformers that are rather somewhat tensor. So this list is not is, is not covered by by this approach. Another one is that it might give you false negatives. So it's a bit subtle, but this is all, also in the Plotkin Power Highland paper. If you look at the theory for non-determinism, and I sum it with exceptions. Just by virtue of this absorptive law inside non the non-deterministic non-determinism non theory, where I have x or x equals x, I get the commutative interaction with exceptions. Okay, so, so I mean, the take-home message is these two get equal, which means that either this or this would be a good description of my combination, but this is P4, so I'm not going to get a, a monad stack, and this isn't. Okay, so, so the tool is, is completely superficial. It doesn't really look at the particular properties of the theories you, you're dealing with. Right? It's only looking at the graph theoretical info you give to it. So, so that's, the, that's its limitation. Okay. But if it does tell you this is the right way, this is, this is a, this, if it, it, it is sound if you get a positive result. If it's negative, then you might actually miss that on the stack. Okay. So, conclusion. So the algebraic perspective, so regardless of whether the tool is, is general or useful, um, I think it's insightful because you kind of see how these things arise somehow. We couldn't really see before. At least I could maybe get the hackers in the room could. Um, and so the actual new things of, uh, in this talk is the, the connection between the Plotkin Power Highland problem and co graphs. So, so this was suggested by Yobatki. Uh, doing some Characterizing the graphs that arise from one of the stacks is just, yeah, that was also new. And the analysis of the scale of the speed transformer is also new. But mostly this is just plugging in the wires. And yeah, the tool, I, I, I used Okamo graph and, and uh, uh, Okamo, uh, JavaScript or Okamo tool just because yeah, I had it. But there's nothing particular about Okamo that we need to do it in almost any language. But the graph theoretical algorithms that are not particularly complicated. And further work is actually, yeah, what Quark said mentioned earlier, right, is to start looking at other, whether those three combinations are everything that we have, that, that, whether some tensor and maybe the kind of distributive combination is all there is, or maybe there's other interesting things out there, probably the latter, and right, start looking a bit more systematically at these more transformers. So I think a good place to start is the scale of thesis. And yeah, I don't have any idea how to do with configurations. We'll see. Yes. Um, thank you. We have time for perhaps one or two questions. So in, in your tool, uh, you specify some of the transformers as some and some like tensors, mm -hmm. but these are binary operations, right? So what, what, what does it mean to say that this one transformer is some or tensor? Right, so, so the, tr the transformer is a unary operator, right? The sum and the tensor are binary operators. Yes. So th this is why you have a bit more expressivity when you're looking at some and tensor terms. Right? If you remember one of the examples we looked at, Right now, was that you get a sum and tensor term, but you don't get the monad stack associated with it. And that's because the sum and tensor term are more, is in this sense, more expressive than, than just monad transformers. Okay. So in, in this sense, it is transformers. Okay. Thank you.
Any further questions? Okay, then let's thank the speaker. Next speaker is Paul Duenen, and he will tell us about interesting observation on continuation. All right, yeah. So I'm going to be uh, talking a bit about delimited control, the way it appears both in the practice on how people actually use these in programs, as well as the uh, theory on how we think about and study these two. And the fact that both of these situations are not exactly the same. So the, con the control operators that people actually program with are not the ones that are being intensely studied. Um, and then we'll see how a little bit of uh, multiple prompts can be used to bring together those two a little bit. Um, so since not everyone might be intimately familiar with control operators or delimited control, I'm going to go through a little crash course on how to understand and uh, figure out what these mean. Um, so. You know, feel perfectly free if this is going a bit slow and everyone kind of knows what's going on. You know, we can skip through it a bit more, but if I'm going a bit too fast, feel free to ask questions and slow me down a little bit. So, the, the real key in order to understand what's going on when you have control effects in play is the ability to separate a redex from its context, or what I'm doing from everything else around me. So uh, here we've got a simple numerical expression. And if we want to reduce this, what do we do? Well, we have to work on the multiplication 3 times 4. That's the next operation we have to do. So that's the redex. And everything else around it is the context. Hopefully, that's pretty straightforward. So when we reduce this term, what do we get? Well, we crunch the number together. We get a 12. And then we plug it back in. And so that's one step of a reduction on the program. So Hopefully that's fairly straightforward. What happens if we throw a control operator into the mix, like call CC from scheme? So, okay, what's the redex? So that's the call to call CC. So we've got, that's what we're doing in green, and everything else in blue is what's around us. And so how do we evaluate call CC? What does that do? Well, what we need to do is put a label we're essentially giving a name to our context at that moment in time. So here we're going to call it K. And then we evaluate the body where K is associated with that context once we call it call CC. And so we stitch everything together, we get that expression, and so what's the next thing we do? Well, we call that K that we just bound with 4. So what happens when we call a continuation that call CC hands us with a value? Well, what we do is we look up that k, it was a context, and it comes in and switches places with what our current context just was. So now we replace where we were at where, with where we were at before. And so we plug in the uh, 4 into that uh, context, and then we get a new expression. So hopefully, that's not too bad. So let's go on now to delimited control. And so what happens here? So the difference, so the thing to notice here with the call CC is that when we called K, we essentially swapped somewhere else. We sort of aborted what we were going to do, and now we're doing something different. So when we look at delimited control, we have a different operator here called F. And also, we've added a new construct called the delimiter. And what does this do? This gives us a bounding box. So when we separate the term 
pulling out the redux and our context, there's another thing, the meta context, which is off limits in terms of the control operator. It doesn't really get to see what that is. It only gets to see the thing in blue. And so what happens when we evaluate the F operator? Well, we assign a name to our context in blue, and we also clear it. So we've cleared our current context. Um, the red was off limits. That doesn't change. And now we stitch everything back together again. And what do we get? We get the outer meta context. One plus prompt is the way to pronou pronounce the hash. And then the, uh, the body of the expression. And then what's the next step? Well, we've, uh, we're calling k. That's the redux, the thing that has to be done. And uh, here is now our immediate context and the meta context that's still off limits. And so what happens now when we call a continuation that was bound by f? Well, instead of swapping out with what we were doing, so instead of changing the thing that was in blue, this now acts like a normal function. So the context 2 plus box we just plug the 4 into the box, and that just becomes the expression result as if it were lambda x 2 plus x. And then we stitch everything together and go on. OK, so that was a little bit of an introduction, hopefully not too fast. And so when we add these two constructs, the delimited control operator and its bounding box limiter, uh, suddenly we end up with a lot of design decisions on how we might actually define what these do, um, leading to a number of different options. So the first option is, does f remove that surrounding delimiter, the hash, um, surrounding our context, or does it leave it in place like we did before? Also, when we call the continuation that was captured by the operator, does it guard its calling site with another delimiter, prompt, um, or does it not? So both of these questions can be answered in yes or no. So that gives us four different options for control operators. Um, so here is a uh, way of classifying these. Essentially, we have four variants on that F operator I just showed you. Um, the plus and the minus signify whether or not the prompt is there. And the left is the surrounding site, and the right is the uh, continuation when I call it. So answering those two different questions, we can divide these in two different ways. The first division is whether or not the uh, surrounding site of the control operator, do we remove the delimiter or do we keep it? And so the ones that are plus F something leave the delimiter intact so that meta continuation stays protected and then the minus f something removes it so now we get direct access to that surrounding meta continuation it's no longer off limits and then the other way when we call a continuation the uh, something f plus will add back a delimiter so that its call site will be guarded and then the something f minus does not so each of these decisions actually corresponds to a uh, def definition for the limit control that occurs in the literature. So plus F plus is commonly known as shift and reset. It's a pretty common uh, one to study. And then we also have plus F minus, which is control and plonk from Felizen, um, is another common basis for the limit control. And the other ones also correspond to operators that occur a bit less often. And now they're often referred to as shift zero or control zero um, as the operators. So now let's, we went through a, uh, a number of different permutations on how we could define these operations, but does it really make a difference? I mean, are we just playing little games or does this actually impact the, what a program does? So let's look at this great example from Biernacki and Olivier Denvi. So it's list traversal in two ways. So the thing to notice is that both S traverse and F traverse are exactly the same except for which operators we use. So basically we're just going down a list. We First we uh, guard when we call the traversal function, we guard with a delimiter. And then on each recursive call we call an operator and then do a cons and invoke the continuation we're handed. 
And so, what do we think? Is there a difference between these? Are they the same? Do we do get something else? Get something different depending on which one we call? Well, what happens is the one using shift is actually just a list copy. It's effectively an identity function. Whereas the one using f reverses the list. And the reason is the shift control operator, the continuation it hands us, guards its calling site with a prompt. So this x cons is off limits. So essentially, once we get to this point, I know that, you know, so if we're going down the list one, two, three, I say, okay, one cons reset. It's going to be one con something. Whereas here, we actually get to uh, lift up and copy this, or move around this context, because it's not guarded. So we can kind of, on every recursive call, we can take our context and pop out in front every single time. So shift is different from control, or s is different from f. What about shift and shift zero? Are those different? So here's a continuation and swap in two ways. We abstract two continuations, and then we apply them in the reverse order. Are they the same? Are they different? And as you might expect, they're a bit different. So uh, with shift, it's the identity function. So the second time, we, so we grab our continuation, so we get our current context, and then we try to do it again, but there's nothing there. We just hit the same reset a second time. And so we don't get anything interesting. So that k2 is just basically the identity function. Whereas when we use shift zero, we grab our first context, the reset's gone, and now we grab a different context and we swap them. So we actually do get different behavior out of these two operators. So there are different ways of defining delimited control that lets us write different programs depending on which operators we use. So now into the difference between what happens in theory and in practice. So in theory, there's a heavy focus on the something f plus operators. So these are shift or shift zero. Um, so shift and reset have had a lot of uh, study in previous years, but more recently, shift zero is popping up a bit more in the theoretical study of delimited control. Um, and the reason is both of these have theories that have nice properties. So there's a simple semantics and continuation passing style that doesn't require a lot of machinery, um, sound and complete axiomizations now, things like that. There's uh, error-free type and effect systems where if it type checks, there's no problem. Yes. What references do you know classical reference on the type systems? Oh, offhand, there's the type system by Danby and Flinsky for uh, a shift and reset, and then for shift zero, there's uh, uh, work done by Matterzok and Yernacki, I believe, uh, has been doing a lot of work on shift zero recently. Um, so that's where to look at. So, so he had a ICFP paper a couple years ago uh, uh, called, uh, it's using subtyping to type uh, delimited control with shift zero. Okay, but in practice, we actually focus on the star f minus operators. So, I mean, the, there's major implementations of delimited control in languages like Racket, or the libraries for Haskell and OCaml, um, the del count libraries. Uh, so those use either control zero and prompt zero, or they use control and prompt as the basis uh, semantics for these operators. Um, and they also look at extensions of the limited control as well. I mean, they're not in a uh, hypergenic chamber. I mean, these are integrated sometimes, like in Racket, to languages with other effects, and that's not a trivial thing to do. And uh, they also, uh, uh, both, all of these have multiple prompts. So um, that's uh, something we're going to look at now as a major extension that when people are using delimited control in practice, that they get to use. So, so why people in practice use prompts? Why? That's a good question that I don't know the answer to, but it seems to be the case that the uh, major implementers uh, favor these. So the reason for at least the Haskell library, I think it's probably similar for the OCaml one, the reasoning being that um, the idea that it's easier to put a prompt back than to remove it if you're not able to. So the theory was if I have a shift, all the resets are there and it's hard to get out. But if I don't have any prompts, if I see the, the minus F minus, they're all gone, and so Oh, well, I can just add them back later, and that's easy. Good. Yes? Is there a question? Yes. So I guess you just yes. answered my question, which was, can one of the variants encode the other variants? And if so, that may be the one. Yes, yeah, so, so here's the thing. So 
uh, in terms of operationally, you can take a program, say, using shift, and then encode it using control zero by adding all the prompts back, and the programs will do the same, but you don't get the same equational theories out of that encoding. Uh, because, uh, so, so there's properties about shift and reset because of those, the fact that the prompts are there, we know more about the, what programs could possibly do. And those are broken in a program that could use control zero to uh, get rid of those invariants. So the fact that you can put the prompts back doesn't mean that we still get the same nice reasoning principles about programs. That's what's lost. Um, so that's the trade-off you get. Um, so giving prompts a name. So this is similar to exceptions. We want to be able to give a name to a prompt and refer to those specifically. So uh, my control operator, I say, I don't just want to capture my continuation up to the nearest prompt. I want to capture up to the nearest prompt named, say, mm -hmm. alpha, um, which is the handler for that particular uh, control abstraction. And then the prompt named alpha will handle all the things, uh, all the control effects that are asking for alpha. OK, so back to the example. Um, so same game, we're trying to separate the Redux from its context. And we also have the meta context. So it gets a bit more interesting now. So here, the f is asking for beta. So that means when we do the separation game, the reset or the prompt for alpha is invisible. We, we pretty much ignore it. And we keep going until we hit that prompt for beta. And then after that point, everything beyond becomes our meta context, which is off limits in red. And so the behavior is essentially going to be the same. The main difference is in the separation. That's what's going to change. When we're splitting apart a program into read x, uh, uh, context, and meta context, that's where the named prompts changes what happens. So we go again. So we invoke k as our next thing to do. That's our read x. And then we have the continuation or the context and meta context in red. And it works pretty much like we had before with k, except that now our captured context has a prompt in it. But other than that, we just plug in the five. That becomes a new expression. And our current context doesn't change. <coughs> this behaves like a function or a function call. OK, now let's look at putting the practice to theory. Um, so there's been uh, some different efforts in trying to understand these delimited control operators when you're using multiple prompts. So one of them is the monadic framework for delimited control. Um, so this presents a language, a pretty basic language, which uh, has control in the style of control zero and prompt zero. So this was what I mentioned before, the idea being we want to remove them all because it's simpler to put them back in, the uh, in well, in practice, I guess, um, but not necessarily in theory. Um, and so the, the key of this implementation is that they use a hybrid, so they give a continuation passing style semantics, but the, there's a hybrid uh, concrete and abstract continuation. So there's a stack, there's a concrete stack, which is just a list that you can uh, iterate and go down, containing both a continuation as a function, which you normally would have in continuation passing style, and also special markers that signify here was a prompt with a particular name. And then there's also uh, another work in understanding uh, delimited control with multiple prompts. And so this one uh, favored shift zero and reset zero style of um, control with multiple prompts. And uh, it would say conservative extension of a particular calculus developed by Perry Go as a way of reasoning about classical proofs in terms of programs. Um, and so it's a conservative extension of this, which is basically a lambda calculus with call CC. And so in this framework, the basic technique is that the prompts and the delimited part is implemented as dynamic continuation variables. So there's a dynamic binding going on in addition to the normal uh, call CC type continuation variable action going on, as well as ways of splitting and joining the dynamic environment containing uh, continuations. So the biggest mismatch to compare these two, so if you want to compare the two, like a framework using control zero 
sort of a more practice-oriented study and a framework using shift zero, a more theoretical one, the biggest mismatch comes down to this representation. The difference between a mark stack, which if we look at the type, is a list of either an identifier, which is the name of the prompt, or a continuation. So it's just a list of, some, in some order, of these two things. Or a dynamic environment, which is a list of pairs associating identifiers with continuations. So it's a bit more orderly. Every prompt has a continuation associated with it, and vice versa. So how do we relate these two to, the, to each other? Well, going one way is pretty easy. Uh, embedding the uh, lambda mu based approach.